Good evening, and thank you for joining our series of conversations on mental health offered by the Sioux Falls School District with experts from Avera. My name is Jeremy Mollett, and tonight we will focus on the topic of recognizing unhealthy eating. During this session, we will share some helpful advice on how to identify and treat unhealthy eating habits, as well as what resources are available. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dr. James Nold, Assistant Superintendent of the Sioux Falls School District, to offer a welcome. Good evening. On behalf of the Sioux Falls School District, I again want to welcome you to this nine part presentation that is titled the Family Forum Series. But first, I want to thank our partners, Avera, and for their partnership and help with the Sioux Falls School District in providing this service to our families. This is the fifth installment of this series, and we hope that you have found the previous presentations and information to be of great benefit. You are welcome to join us on the third Tuesday of each month to hear information on a variety of topics that are intended to strengthen and support our families by providing information and resources that exist right here in our community. And now, I look forward to hearing from our presenter this evening, and please do not hesitate to provide us feedback on the Sioux Falls School District Let's Talk app that can be found on the Sioux Falls School District website. All of these presentations can be found on the Sioux Falls School District website at our counseling homepage. Thank you again, and now back to Mr. Mollett to introduce this evening's presenter. Thanks, Dr. Knoll. We will now move to the presentation. We are pre-recording this session, so we'll not be taking live questions, but we will leave some time at the end to address some of the top concerns we hear from parents. Tonight's program will be presented by Faith Carlson. Faith is a licensed professional counselor and mental health therapist at Avera Behavioral Health. Welcome, Faith, and thank you for presenting. Thank you, Dr. Nold and Jeremy. I really appreciate the opportunity uh, to be present here today to share this valuable information on eating behaviors and supports that we can provide the community. And we're really looking forward to a great evening of information and supports going forward. All right, today we're going to be going over um, a really important information on eating behaviors. Um, this is a great opportunity to gain insights into really the opportunity to do early interventions and support. So I appreciate you collaborating with us in, in uh, connecting into options to get, get our, our youth and our students earlier interventions for supports. Um, my name again is Faith Carlson and I'm actually a licensed uh, clinical counselor in South Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, and Florida. Um, a big piece of this is I am a, um, a part of the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals. So having the opportunity to really specialize in this field and share this knowledge with you is, is a great opportunity. So I appreciate that. Um, the first thing I wanted to really go over is really identifying different presentations of eating disorders or disordered eating, being able to identify the treatments and symptoms that will present um, and options for supports. And then a big piece of this is resources. Um, we know nationally that there's um, a lack of resources for eating recovery and eating supports across again the nation. And so I really want everybody to have um, some, some resources that they can take and actually use in their settings um, wherever they're located. First thing we want to be able to do is identify um, what is an eating disorder. And it's really, really important. A few key take home items here is while we have uh, labels or, or diagnosis criteria, we want to recognize a couple um, major features that are going to be presenting, but also some atypical features. Um, we all are quite aware of like anorexia nervosa. That's a, a well-known um, eating disorder that probably gets the most attention, I feel like, out of all of the, the diagnoses. Um, and what that's really going to look like is energy restriction, so lower caloric intake. We're going to see a, a significant low weight, um, intense fear and anxieties around gaining weight, and then there's going to be a distortion in how individuals actually see their, their shape and body. Um, we'll go a little bit more into atypical anorexia nervosa. That's a, a larger portion, I feel like, of the population. Um, bulimia nervosa is going to be very similar to restrictions. Um, what we would end up seeing is eating a large amount of food. The definition of a binge eating is eating a large amount of food in a short period of time than what is considered norm. And so you want to kind of take that into context when we're thinking of what is a large amount of food um, in any setting. Um, binges are followed either by purging, which would be the, the vomit of excessive exercise. So it's not that these are all presenting. It may be a few of these features that are actually presenting. Um, so restriction can be that excessive exercise, lack of use, diet pills, diuretics, a lot of coffee drinking, um, caffeine drinks. Those are a lot of big things that kind of suppress that appetite. 
Um, vaping, that's another one that will be used to suppress appetite. So when we think of, again, bulimia nervosa, it, it's going to be eating a large amount of food in a short period of time, but then there's going to be compensatory behaviors that are happening afterward to try to reduce that caloric intake. Um, where anorexia nervosa is just really pure restriction of caloric intake. Um, intense fear and body disturbance shapes and about weight and, and appearance is going to carry over to both sides as well. Binge eating disorder, this actually just got added to our medical diagnostic manuals um, most recently, and this is going to be eating, again, a, a much, much larger amount of food in a shorter amount of time than what's considered normal. Um, eating until uncomfortably full or excessively eating when not hungry. The biggest key takeaway I take on this diagnosis and symptom is guilt and shame. So when anybody's eating a large amount of food and that's correlated with guilt and shame, that's a really big indicator for that binge eating. Um, and that's what we really see in that uh, emotional presentation is, is guilt, low self-esteem, shame, um, feelings of failure, um, but they're gonna be correlated in what they have ate and how they feel about themselves because of what they ate. Um, this section, I, I, when I think of my caseloads, I'm really thinking about um, this, this other specified feeding and eating disorder column. And what this is is gonna be this atypical presentation. So when somebody shows up with um, disordered eating behaviors or an eating disorder, it doesn't always have to check all the boxes of each of these criteria. And that's how we recognize atypical anorexia. And I really, really wanted to hit this home. Like if there's one thing you guys can take away from this presentation is this atypical. And what that means is that you may have a higher weighted student or um, you know, individual you're working with, and they can be starving. They can not be eating the right amount of food. They can have serious medical complications. They can have serious uh, emotional, mental health complications. But just because they don't look like they are starving doesn't mean that they are not starving. Um, I think that's the biggest, biggest takeaway is that individuals that are not eating, starvation is starvation. And so um, when we see, you know, these adolescents, these um, middle schoolers, high schoolers, and they appear of normal weighted size or maybe um, a slightly higher weighted size, that doesn't mean that they're eating. That that very likely and oftentimes does mean that they're restricting and not getting the mal the, the nutrition that they actually need. They're, they're really malnourished. Um, so atypical, I put anorexia in there because that's probably about 75% of my presentation of clients, um, but that can be anorexia or atypical uh, binge eating as well. So they may be an individual that is higher weighted, but again, they're, they're restricting, they're not eating. Um, avoidant restrictive food intake, this is another one that was recently added to our medical model. And what that really looks like is our, it's short versions are fit. Um, you'll hear people say that they're a picky eater. They really have no interest in food. The brain's wired in a way that they actually are not interested. It, it doesn't catch their attention. Um, they may have texture and taste sensitivities. They could have fears of vomiting if they're eating something. And then it's like, oh gosh, I'm so, my anxiety is so high. I'm going to avoid this food because maybe when I was three and I, I ate something and I threw up, now I've associated that fear with that food. Um, this is a smaller portion of the population, ARFID. Um, I think that it largely goes unrecognized, um, but it is one of the more complex ones because, again, the mind doesn't light up about food. So when you when you come across individuals that are really, again, that picky eating food choices, they might have like eight to ten food choices that they're eating. Um, it's, you're going to see in the school settings, you're going to see the same foods every day at, at the lunch areas. It, it, you're not going to see any variations. Um, and those are going to be, again, the individuals that really, really need a lot of support and early on because it's it's it, these are truly like lifelong um, um, triggers on food exposures. It can be really challenging to get, get that expansion in there. Um, for our next one, we've got orthorexia. This one is starting to um, be more recognized. It's going to be preoccupation, preoccupation with being healthy. And what that really represents is clean eating, um, individuals that are hyper fixated on specific foods that um, are maybe low in fats that are um, like uh, greens that are, are, they're not getting the, the nutrition that they need. But the behavioral side of it is that they spend an excessive amount of time that impacts their social and personal functioning. So that's gonna be individuals again that are um, really kind of that obsessive rigidity around specific types of foods. There's not going to be much variance, but they'll spend easily two to three hours 
um, working around eating certain clean types of foods. And um, I suspect that will be added into our medical uh, manuals coming forward in our, in our next DSM. I did wanna highlight disordered eating. Um, when we think about an eating disorder, it doesn't go from normative eating to hopping over to an eating disorder. It doesn't happen that way. What you will actually see is that, that normative eating, three meals a day, we've got the snacks in there, and then you're gonna slowly start to see the disordered eating aspects. And what that just means is you're gonna see missed out meals, periodically, or there's going to be uh, rigidity around foods periodically, and then that slowly starts to build up where now it's getting so rigid. We have weight loss, we have rules around food, we have guilt and shame, and that's really going to hit that eating disorder aspect. I, I really hold those two to a similar aspect because when I'm treating my eating disorder patients, we're really working from an eating disorder, bringing it down to disordered eating and back down to normative eating. Um, but if we can catch you know, these clients that are at that disordered eating, you know, if they're skipping meals periodically, if they're, if they're um, expressing being hungry, but they're not honoring those hunger cues, that's a, a great time to be able to have a, a conversation about the importance of nutrition, um, because that's a slippery slope that can get really caught up in that eating disorder. Another thing I really, really want to hit home here alongside that atypical presentation is that eating disorders are serious mental health disorders. These are not weight disorders. These are not food disorders. Um, we cannot doctor this away. We cannot use just a nutritionist to get this better. They're, they're in our mental health diagnosis because it is a mental health disorder. Um, the weight and food are used as assessments for the eating disorder, but I'm not fully focused on weight restoration or food types that they're eating. We really want to bring down what's happening in the mind, and that's going to be a lot of noise in the mind, a lot of um, obsessive compulsive behaviors, uh, thoughts, uh, anxieties, a lot of guilt and shame. Um, a really great analogy I love to use is a, clients with eating disorders. It's like if you were to record a lot of critical um, statements to yourself, like I'm fat, I am unattractive, I shouldn't have ate that, I, um, I'm failing. Put that on a tape recorder and put headphones on. That's what my eating disorder patients are hearing in their mind all day long, seven days a week. It doesn't turn off. And so when we really think about a mental health disorder, that's really the presentation of, of what it is. The symptoms are weight and food, but it's it's in the in the cognitions, in the mind. The other piece is eating disorders have the highest mortality rate of any mental illness, just second to opioid overdoses. So out of all of our depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, all of these diagnoses, the number one cause of death is gonna be from an eating disorder. That's in part from suicide, about 25% will commit suicide. The others will go into a cardiac arrest or have uh, organ failure and pass away from, from medical complications. A lot of individuals aren't aware of that and that's something that's really, really key to take home too is, is the um, severity of this. We know that earlier the intervention, the better the outcomes, Average onset's about 12 to 13 years old. And if we can get to these clients at an early age, we can try to stop the presentation where it gets so severe later on that this ends up being a statistic of mortality. Um, I do always like to mention that about 10 to 15% of people with anorexia or bulimia are males. Um, the thin ideal is very pervasive and it it's, um, presents in sports, it presents in social media. Um, family systems, eating disorders, there's about a 52% average uh, correlation to genetic components and then about 48% social. So we've kind of discovered that makeup is it, there's that genetic component and social component. But when you think of social media, um, I really, really advocate for families getting uh, social media literate because that's been correlated to, to uh, influencing eating disorders. Um, and again, there's no statistics showing any differences between ethnic groups, onsets. It doesn't matter, you know, what um, community, race, gender, this presents similar because we have that genetic component that's presenting. Key themes that you want to take away when you're working with someone or come across someone with um, disordered eating or eating disorder, personal functioning. I'm always assessing academic functioning or occupational functioning and social functioning. So we don't need all of these that come into play to have a diagnosis, but you're going to see an impact. I think in the school settings, what you guys are really going to see is that academic functioning 
um, and social functioning. I think those are going to be pieces that you guys will start to recognize or are, are already recognizing something's amiss. Um, this will be a little bit more detail we'll go over, but that academic function, you're going to see a decline in, in um, performance with grades. You're going to see a decline in more isolation in the social aspects. And then the personal functioning, depression, anxiety, those are going to key up. Those are going to go up pretty high as well. We um, just discovered genetically there's eight genetic components in an eating disorder so far, microbiomarkers, and those are OCD, anxiety, depression. Um, we are discovering a biomarker for schizophrenia, autism, diabetes. These are all biomarkers that we're just starting to discover with the eating disorder. So you can see that this is going to impact these different areas, but that this is so much more than just somebody saying they're not eating. It's not a switch. It's not a fad. There's a lot of things that are happening um, that make these kind of complex diagnoses. Um, again, just to go over this in a little bit detail, like if you guys start to see these types of behaviors and these things, these are flags. I would say these are yellow to red flags that really need to catch the attention and really screen a little bit further. Um, in the social setting, you're going to see individuals acting more withdrawn, again, sad, overly anxious. They're going to be really having a hard time interacting with friends or family. Um, they're not going to want to like socialize as much. Um, I always say eating disorders thrive in isolation. And so that's a key piece, you know, if they're, they're dropping out of school or work performance groups, clubs, sports, um, if they're, they're lacking interest in the things that they used to enjoy. Um, a big piece of this, if they refuse to eat in front of others. Um, in the cafeteria, I have so many pieces of information that are flags for me when I have my clients discussing what's happening and they don't want to eat with peers at the table because they're comparing and competing. Um, just cognitively, and that's something that's super hard for a lot of patients that are working with an eating disorder. Um, they may seem overly sensitive, and they have a really hard time regulating emotions because they're malnourished. Their brain's not fueled to be able to use critical thinking skills, to be able to use the coping skills, to be able to regulate down and, and be able to, to process through cognitively. Um, behaviorally, again, you're going to see eating alone portions. You're going to see very small portions of foods. You're going to see probably a lot of protein. Um, you're going to see similar foods. I mean, the individuals will be eating the same types of foods for months. Um, anxiety, food rules, which are going to be, um, you know, I shouldn't have or I'm not supposed to have carbs. If I have carbs, then I need to exercise. I need to do something to offset that. Um, and then we're going to also see um, other behavioral symptoms, which is avoiding the social settings, compulsive exercise, movement, restlessness. About 52% or 50, between 50 and 60 percent, it's right in that range of athletes actually struggle with disordered eating, if not an eating disorder. So that's something to really keep in mind, too, when we think of compulsive exercise. Um, very few facilities in the nation actually help support specifically athletes. And that's something that we really want to start to expand awareness on with coaches and uh, professionals that are in the, in the school system that really work in those sports aspects. Uh, rigid behaviors, how much they're eating, times that they're eating, and a big key piece again is routines. They become very inflexible. When there's a time to eat, there's a lot of anxiety if that time changes and food choices are not flexible. You know, it's, it's going to be the same types of foods that they're eating. Um, the National Eating Disorder Awareness brought up nine truths of eating disorders and all the research that gets created in the United States tries to leverage off one, if not more than one of these truths in what we're trying to uh, discover um, supports for in the treatment. And I think this is a really, really, really big one. Again, it goes back to the atypical presentation that many people with an eating disorder look healthy yet may be extremely ill. And what that means is their heart rate can be really, really low. They can have such symptoms that aren't presenting in front of individuals. And that creates an invalidation when someone looks like they're healthy, but they're starving. That's invalidating the severity of this. And now we can start to see how this becomes the number one cause of death, right, in, in the mental health field, is that we need to validate that they may look healthy. They can present with a typical presentation, but not be healthy at all. Um, they can have bradycardia. They can end up with um, labs that are abnormal. It's just so important to see this population, and I challenge our, our medical field and, and uh, professionals, leaders, to not put the perception that an eating disorder is a anorexic underweight individual. That's not the truth. We have to unlearn that. Um, families are not to blame, and they can actually be the patient's and provider's best allies in treatment. An eating disorder diagnosis, it's a health crisis that disrupts, again, personal and family functioning, academics, 
uh, occupational functioning. These are not choices. Uh, clients don't wake up in the morning and decide they want to have an eating disorder, and it's not a switch. And you can't rationalize it. You can't talk them through it and and get them to eat. A lot of a lot of individuals say, "Just eat." Why don't they just eat? That's actually so invalidating because so much more is happening in the mind. Um, and this is really really important to recognize those biological, genetic influences that are are coming into play. Um, they affect all people of genders, races, ages, ethnicities, um, socioeconomic statuses. It's not a, a Caucasian female that's that's been perpetuated, I think, historically. This is this affects every everyone across the board. Um, again, eating disorders carry an increased risk for both suicide and medical complications. The genetics and environment play important roles in the development of eating disorders, and then the genes alone do not predict who develop eating disorders. I think that's a, a key takeaway as well, is we can still flex genetics to be able to um, get to recovery. Recovery is possible with eating disorders, but we can't help them when they're when they're in this 20, 30 years, they end up being severe and enduring eating disorders. Um, and those prognoses are, are not optimal. Again, if we can get get supports to this population at 12, 13, 14, early college years, that's so key. I, I, I just ask that that those interventions and highlights really, really uh, keep in mind because that's that's the typical onset of this this disorder. Um, again, they don't go away on their own. You can't doctor this away alone. You, you really have a treatment team that involves a doctor, a dietitian, and a therapist. Um, that's the, the medical model, the, the therapeutic model. Um, leaving them untreated can have serious years consequences. Um, they're associated to other mental health disorders like we've expressed, uh, depression, anxiety. Um, again, I go back to the bradycardia, the, the heart rhythms. Those are so serious on conditions and we really want to keep an eye on how they're doing. Um, and they state that one in 10, the National Health Institution state one in 10 end up in death or starvation from starvation or suicide. Um, medical complications. Again, it's going back to that heart, kidney failure. Those are things that start to, to present when we're malnourished for the, the times that these, these um, individuals are, are getting underfed and undernourished. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention as well, when you're working with a dietitian, you know, on a treatment team, it, the specialty is such a key. Um, dietitians are not generally trained with eating disorders, so it's really key to find supports with a, a trained dietitian. Um, supports with a trained clinician, um, supporting advocacy with the medical actors. At the front line where you guys would be at with interventions is those assessments and then recommendations to getting, you know, getting them connected into a medical doctor provider. Um, I think that that's going to be such a key piece of this recovery process is allowing those supports to happen. Um, the the slideshow we'll have on here, we'll have a, a scoff questionnaire that I'll screen over here too. This is something that is um, it's something you can apply to ages 12 and up. Um, it's it's a tool that you can use in any um, academic setting, counseling setting. Um, really, it, it's it's such a quick screener. We call it the SCOF questionnaire. And if two or more of these are answered as a yes, that for me would be a yellow going into a red flag. Something's happening here, and so we really want you to to do some intervention supports. Get them, um, get them connected with parents and, and into the doctors. Um, but you can print this off, ask these questions. These the scoff questionnaire is a really, really key piece. That's just that beginning screener to get them into more comprehensive supports. All right. So how do I have the conversation? Um, you know, as a parent, when I um, a parent myself, when I think of having these conversations, you're going to get a lot of short answers. That you know, I actually have a list of common replies, things are going to be like, it's fine, nothing's wrong, I'm okay. So when you ask questions, don't be afraid to ask questions. You know, you're going to be their biggest advocate and you're going to also know their behaviors. And so when you ask questions, being able to, to have a, an open, honest conversation, um, inquiring about how they're eating, how they're feeling, how they're sleeping. You know, I ask how they're sleeping because that's one of my five diagnostic criteria to regulate when I'm working with eating recovery is regulating sleep. And so you ask how they're sleeping, they're going to reply, fine, I'm doing, I'm sleeping good. Get more into the details. How many hours are you sleeping? Like, how did you sleep last night? How long did you sleep? Because once you get into these details, what they may say is fine, you find out it's four hours of sleep. That's not enough sleep. But you can segue this into, okay, how are you eating? Did you get something to eat? Did you have lunch? Yeah, I had lunch. Okay, what we really want to ask, what did you have for lunch? Did you finish it? 
You know, how are you feeling after having lunch? These are the questions that you really want to get into, but you want to get into the details of it because if you ask a general question, you're going to get, it's fine, I'm okay, um, I'm good. That's not the answers we really want to find out what's happening. And if they start to clam up and not explore further when you're getting into those details, something's distressing them, you know, and, and as a parent, you, you have that attachment with them to be able to um, reduce that shame and guilt that comes with eating disorders. And, and be able to, to validate them because there's been so much invalidation in, in the world that they're functioning in. So you can validate that if there's a, a concern that you wanna be a support for them, you wanna get them the support that they deserve. So when you're, when you're asking questions, it is having that conversation, um, asking about sleep and eating, um, trying not to use any guilt or shame type techniques to get an answer or explore further. Um, I think building that trust is gonna be a key piece of it and building that trust to advocate for long-term recovery and, and getting access to the resources to help them. Um, if there's any point where there's uncertainty or you don't have those answers or you don't feel comfortable, trust that intuition. You know, make a, an appointment with a doctor's office, get into a counselor's office to be able to uh, screen it. Um, you can also um, use resources like the National Eating Disorder Awareness website. They have a, a free screening tool on there as well. Um, that's just a short questionnaire. And those are resources that are available to get early interventions. We want to be able to have those access supports right away. Additional supports that can be available um, after asking some of those questions, it's like, what do we do next? Now what? And so when we're thinking about this, we really want to see how do we get them supports. Um, here at Avira, we have individual therapy that we offer supports through. We do offer a group therapy support. We screen individuals to be able to assess that. So if you're not quite sure if they, they um, have an eating disorder or disordered eating, don't be afraid to call and ask. We want you to call and ask. We want to be able to address these questions because again, the earlier the interventions, those better those outcomes. Um, so those group therapies are for adolescents and adults. We have those on uh, Wednesday and Thursday evening. We also offer virtual therapy. Um, sometimes it's hard to get appointments made and, and, and drive kids to an appointment. Um, we do have the ability to do virtual therapy um, right, right from home. So, you know, they just need internet connection and we can run a session. Um, and I do that often with many clients. Um, and that's that's a great support. Uh, the SCOF questionnaire I put on there, again, that's going to be that questionnaire that just asks those general questions and then um, it, it gives you the indicator to get higher level assessments going as well. Higher level care, um, the tricky part is, is nationally, there's a shortage of supports for higher level care. Um, so the programs that are available are going to be out of state, which will be the residential programs. Um, intensive outpatient programs and partial hospitalization project programs are all going to be out of state. Um, we do have one provider in state that does virtual supports um, and they're called Equip um, and that would be another resource. Um, Eating Recovery Center, they're on here as well. If you go to their website, you can do a free assessment with a, a trained licensed mental health provider. It is free. It does not cost anything. It doesn't mean that you're signing up to go into Eating Recovery Center, but what this does is it gives you the indicator. If you're not sure, you're, you just want to know if there's something that, that needs more supports, you can contact Eating Recovery Center. Um, again, it's free. Set up an appointment and a licensed clinician will go through and actually ask questions and give you some feedback and some supports. They also offer family supports virtually um, for free in the state of South Dakota, um, social supports, individual supports, and those are all through group therapies. Um, we recognize after COVID that the prevalence for eating disorders doubled in, in the years since COVID over that time frame. Um, so we have a bit of a pandemic in, in mental health, but with eating disorders. So we're getting a lot of supports in South Dakota from our partners across the nation and not to be afraid to use them. They're, they're wonderful supports. Um, additionally, um, at Avira, we offer peer-to-peer -peer professional supports Wednesday morning. So if there's counselors that are calling in or doctors calling in and they're just needing to staff a case, um, not to hesitate to reach out to us, we offer that at no cost, it's free. Um, and again, it's just to be able to give some, some more collaboration and supports in, in treating and serving this population. Um, if you have somebody that's coming out of higher level care and into South Dakota, um, again, we're working on expanding services, but I advocate for building a bridge. And what that just means is we can do double sessions a week. We get a dietitian going and we can actually create almost an intensive outpatient support system with the services we have. And we advocate for that as well. So we will do everything and anything we can do to get this, the support going and, and helping after that higher level care service as well. So taking all this information, the National Eating Disorders website, 
um, association. And they have great resources in there as well. Screening tools, supports for toolkits on teachers, toolkits for coaches, uh, toolkits for family members are about 60 to 80 pages, you know, in manuals, but they're free. Um, be sure to jump on there and, and peruse that website as well. And again, if you ever have questions, do not ever hesitate to reach out to Avira, our support systems here. We want to advocate and, and really, really change that statistic in early interventions and then also reducing reducing those, those tragedies in, in this uh, diagnosis. So I appreciate the opportunity to share this information. If there's extra questions, uh, to hesitate to reach out. We have our citations right at the end for, for additional resources if you are interested in further readings. Ms. Carlson, uh, thank you. We appreciate the importance and the presentation that you brought us this evening. And I know this is some information that is that is vital for our families uh, to be able to be healthy and have their children be healthy and to be able to identify some of these things that could be even at times fatal. So we we thank you for that presentation. A couple questions that we we would have, um, you know, as even a, a parent of, of two children, uh, as they go through different phases and they grow through life, uh, some of their, their appetites change. And as a teenage son, you know, the amount of food that they eat, especially if they're involved in activities at the time, it's hard sometimes to identify what's normal and what's not normal. So what advice would you be able to give parents to help to identify what is just some normal changes that their child would have going throughout uh, with eating patterns? And what are some things that would maybe cause some concern that they should seek out some help and have those conversations that you talked about? Great question. I think that the, the biggest key takeaway is what we really are looking at is three meals a day and snacks in between, right? So when we start, like that's our baseline is having breakfast, lunch, dinner, and we're gonna have snacks in between. Now, the reality is some of those get missed, right? We're running out the door, breakfast gets missed. What a big indicator you guys really want to watch for is when we get down to one meal a day, maybe two meals a day, and you start to see a pattern of rigidity. Those are huge indicators something's amiss, that something's not balancing out right. Um, when we recognize the um, maybe ebbs and flows of eating, a little bit of overeating, a little bit of undereating, that should not be something that's lasting months. Right. So when we think of maybe there's a little bit of change around eating and it's been a few weeks, but then they go back to maybe their routines of eating um, that were prior to those changes. You know your kids the best. And when you start to see significant changes that just seem out of the norm, trust that intuition, you know, and then if you offer more food and they're rejecting it or they're not engaging or there's a reactivity, that's another flag. Um, and when I say reject it, it may be that their their irritability is higher, um, their anxiety is higher around things. If you're going out to eat and all of a sudden they're not picking the foods that they used to eat, they're um, they're eating very slow. It takes a long time. They're not finishing meals. Those are all little flags that you just want to kind of keep in the back of your mind and then just kind of pair it in with the social functioning, the academic functioning. How are they sleeping? Put those pieces together and then and then being able to ask questions and even checking with the primary care doctor when you do those well checks to be able to just inquire. If you start to see a trend on weight reduction, and we start sliding down on that weight number, that's another indicator you guys really want to keep an eye on. Thank you. One uh, final question we'd have here is, you know, parents become sometimes timid to be able to involve themselves and, and they become a little bit nervous about that. They don't want to break a relationship with their child. And so how involved should a parent be? If they truly suspect that there could be some type of an eating disorder, how involved should that parent be in that process? Another great question. You, um, with parents, you have to recognize that you guys are the number one advocate and cheerleader. As a therapist, I'm with them for a, a short period of time. I won't be with them their whole life. The doctor is a little bit longer with them if they're a pediatrician, at least till 18, right? Um, and so parents are the number one cheerleaders. Um, they're the ones that are going to really hold that space for them. And while there's going to be this uh, awkwardness or this distress, this anxiety that might start to create, that's an indicator that more help is needed. And when we bring on our dietitians, our dietitians are the ones that actually put kind of like that. You don't get to not eat your snacks or meals. If you can't eat them, what's the reasons we can't eat them? And then that dietitian and the therapist, we really help build in that like accountability factor just so that it isn't so stressful on a parent or a family system. Um, but I, I can't express enough how much the family system support is going to be vital because that's that you guys are the long term support systems. Um, and that'll be that early intervention, even at that maintenance stage as they transition through life. Um, this is going to be a key support 
um, the more encouragement you can get and, and confidence in helping them in this journey. It would be um, just like if they had, you know, a, a diabetes or if they had, uh, you know, a broken leg. Think of how you would approach care in those models and then use that in this eating feeding model as well because they deserve that and you, you're, you're, you're going to be um, just so, so supportive in a secure attachment for, the, for them that that's going to help change outcomes literally for, for this eating recovery. Thanks, Faith. That was a lot of really good uh, information, and thank you for presenting tonight's session on recognizing unhealthy eating. Uh, as a reminder, this session will be added to the Sioux Falls School District's website under the Counseling Services tab. Our next session will focus on vaping and what parents should be aware of when it comes to their children's health. This will be presented on February 21st from 6 to 7 p.m., and login information will be under the Counseling Services area. Thank you for joining us, and have a great night.